which are colorless, so we would only ever like to see the singlet representation, okay? And there's two ways to get the singlet. That's either by coupling three quarks like that or by coupling a quark and an antiquark to get a meson, okay? So we would, we would never expect to be able to measure, say, the state that you've just written down in an experiment if you're thinking about SU3 as, as color. Oh, sure. I mean, you know what? You've got a group. Now you've got a bunch of group theory. If you want to use the group theory, you're going to have to include some physics. If this was flavor, then it would be a different situation. And you know, there's this very famous eightfold way, I think it's called, of, of Galvan and Neumann. Um, what, what, what they did is they used flav different flavor groups, and they were calculating the representations of the flavor group. And then you look at a specific representation, and you say, oh, this is a six-dimensional representation. We should find six particles with nearly the same masses. So, so that would have been a different application then for group theory. In, in that case, the, the group would correspond to a flavor symmetry of the theory. So for the color symmetry, um, those wouldn't have any interpretation. For flavor symmetry, they would. Or they might. Okay. So you're saying that not all representations are exhaustively useful. That's so right. So we have to pick out the ones that we might... Well, right. you know, I mean, confinement is a drastic example of this because confinement says to you, don't use any of the representations except the singlet. Okay. So now... If SU3 is color, yes, that wouldn't be used, okay? But, but for example, I mean, one place where you would use this is um, you heard at the end of Clifford's talk yesterday, he was talking about ADS CFT. Well, in that case, in the case that he was talking about where you've got this hidden S5, um, you can think of the symmetry of that S5 as an SU4. And in that case, you can build up representations of the SU4, and those would correspond to gravitons, for example, of a specific angular momentum. So in that case, when people talk about, say, giant gravitons and the interaction of giant gravitons, oh boy, you use this group theory all over the place, okay? So it just depends on the problem you're looking at. Yeah, I, I shouldn't have discussed confinement too much, I guess, okay? Confinement's drastic. That's the only time where you only use the singlet. There's lots of cases where you'd use all of the representations and you need knowledge of how they combine and how you'd use them. Okay, so, so now... Um, let's check. So, 10 minutes. This might not be possible, but, um, well, let's try it. Okay, so, so we're, I'm going to take a product. I'm going to consider um, SU3, and what we're going to do is we're going to take two eight representations and multiply them. So I'm going to multiply an eight by an eight. So I want to take that times by that, okay? So that times that gives you what? Now here's the general idea. I'm going to start taking boxes off this guy and I'm going to add them onto that guy. But I'm going to do it in a specific way according to some rules. To write down what the rules are, I am going to label the second box. Diagram. So the diagram that I'm going to dismantle, I'm going to label. And in general, I will put letters in here, and I will use the same letter for the same row. So when I go to the next row, I get a B. If I was going to multiply something with this guy, how would I label this? Well, same letter for the first row, same letter for the second row, same letter for the third row, same letter for the fourth row. Okay? Now what I would start doing is I would start taking letters off of this diagram and start adding it to this diagram. I can only add in boxes in a way that will leave me with a legal shape for the, for the young diagram because at the end of the day I want to get a representation that I can actually um, identify. So let me see. If I add this first box A, so I start... I would always start with the first row and start taking boxes off here and adding them to the second diagram, then move to the next row, then the next, then the next. Um, so I'm going to add, so I'm going to put my working over here. So I'm going to add, first of all, the first box. So the first thing I could do 
is add the A over there. That's a legal shape. Or I could add the A over there. That's a legal shape. Or I could add um, the A over there. That's also a legal shape. After I put in the first one, I'm now going to add the second box. That box is gone. I've used that one. Now let me add in that box. If I take that box, I could put it over there. Or I could put it over there. Or I could put it over there. OK, good. So I've got these. Um, now let me come to this diagram over here. If I add the A box over here, ah, I've got that. So I'm not going to put it in again. I've already got that shape. Remember, each shape corresponds to a certain symmetry of the tensors. And if I put the A here, I would have, sorry, if I put the A here, I would have an A and an A, exactly the same thing here, A and an A. So I'm not going to add that one in again. Or could I put the box over here? No, that wouldn't give me a valid shape. But I could also put it over here if I wanted. And if I put it there, I would get this. OK. And then, so I've got those. Now I'm going to come to the last one. Um, and what I can do when I get to the last diagram is there is an A. There is an A. Now, OK, good. I have that one already. Excellent. So I'm not going to put one there. So I put one here, right? Uh, I got that one already. OK, that's no good. So I'll put it here. Does that look OK? Now, there's two reasons to dislike that. The first reason is that we said that we were dealing with SU3, so we had at most n boxes. Well, that's four boxes for a start, so you don't want to do that. And there's another reason to dislike that. Well, if you look at this tensor over here, what was our rule? Our rule said they were in the same row, so what should we have done? We should have made the tensor symmetric between those two A's. And now, because they land up in the same column, you're told to anti-symmetrize them. Well, <laughs> you can't do that. If you started off that was something that was symmetric, and you now want to calculate the anti-symmetric piece of a symmetric thing, that's going to be naught. So you can't stick letters in the same column. So that one wouldn't be here either. So those are the only ones we have to deal with. And now let's add our last box, which is the B. So the A is gone. Now let's put the B in. OK, so, so let's start doing that. So the first place that we could add a B would be over here. So let's just add that in. There's one more rule that I haven't told you that I will have to mention in a while. There's an A and a B. And then I get that sitting over there. Ah, oh, two A's. OK, good. That, so that one is going to die, that's for sure. OK, but um, let's just leave it there for now. Now, then we're going to stick a B over here. B and two A's. But that's great. So you see, you guys are getting the idea. The shape corresponds to the symmetry. And we're going to stick a last B over here. There is a B. There is an A. And there is an A. 
Okay. Now, now, what I'm going to do at this stage is the following. So you could keep going and you'd get all of the others. Boom, 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 boom. Now, once you finish doing this, you have to read your diagram and you have to make sure that it's what's called a lattice permutation. So I can't give you an intuitive way to understand this rule. So, so let me just tell you what it is um, and you'll be able to tell which diagrams you should exclude. So the way that you, you read your final tableau, you would start in the first row and you would read A, A, so read like that, then come to this row, read like that, then come to this row, read like that, and finally read down there. Is it clear how we're reading it? When you read your tableau, you must always have more A's than B's, and more B's than C's, and more C's than D's, if you stopped reading at any point. Now, when I read over here, I read, I'm going to stop here. How many B's did I read? One. How many A's did I read? None. No. That's not a valid tableau. I would chuck that one away. Yep, Norm? Uh, is it okay that you have, say, say the one, the problem with the B's and the A's, would it be okay that you had five blocks in a row and stop even reading any of those? Yeah. Ah, okay. Yep, you see? If I've got um, ten objects, I couldn't make something that's anti-symmetric that has got 11 indices. But if I get t 10 objects, I can easily make something that's symmetric with 100 indices. So it doesn't matter how big the, ta the diagrams get in this direction. The only cutoff that you have is in that direction. Okay? So that one would be chucked away. Now, and ah, if we look at this one, okay, this is valid if we read the diagram, but I want you to notice something else. We're dealing with SU3 here. So I can cross out those three boxes. Those three boxes are the singlet, and I could replace this by just three boxes in a line. So I can cross those three out. Those don't transform. So this thing behaves as a tensor with three indices that is symmetric in those three indices. Okay, you now have all of the rules. Um, so, so we don't have time to complete this in detail. But let me write up the answer, and, and you should be able to check that you get this. So, so this is a nice thing to check. Um, and I'll show you that you could make up your own homework if you wanted to, because there's a way to check that you always get the right answer. Um, and it's the following. So for this particular example, we were multiplying that with that. Well, this is an 8 times an 8. What is 8 times 8? 64. Great. So we've got 64 on this side of the equation. And if you do the multiplication properly, this is what you should get. Now, okay, uh, that's fine so far. Um, plus, actually, you would get this, which is just one, right? Because that's two blocks of three. I've dropped some blocks of three in certain other places, and you would get that. If you calculate the dimensions of these representations, this thing has got dimension 10. This thing has got dimension 8. This has got dimension 27. Um, this has got dimension 10. This is a singlet, right? That's three boxes and three boxes, so that just counts as one. And this last one has got dimension 8. So let's check. Um, 10 plus 10, that's 20. Plus 16 is 36. Plus 1 is 37. 47, 57, plus 7 is 64. So the dimensions on both sides match. Okay. So, so what you could do if you wanted to, you could, if you were really um, wanting to show that you've mastered this, you could take the 27 times the 27. And you could put all of those boxes down, and eventually you'd get representations on both sides, go through the rules. When you take 27 times 27, that must equal the sum of all of the stuff that you'd have on this side. If you manage to do that, you understand the rules. Okay? And I think this is a good place to stop. Are there any questions?